Hello everyone. Welcome to Tea with TPS. Today our guest is Dr. Professor Chance James, former Vice Chancellor of Hemphill University, also former Vice Chancellor of the Central University of Kerala. She has been described in many ways. People say she is the first woman Vice Chancellor in Kerala. Some people say that she is the only smiling Vice Chancellor they have met. She has also the reputation of being a great teacher, a writer, and many others. Even Paranatyam Dutch. But I'd like to call her just one name. The Vice Chancellor of Vice Chancellors. Why I say this? Because no one else has become a Vice Chancellor at her age, I think. And also at the prime of life. And also she had the opportunity to run two different systems of universities. So she can be called really, I don't think there is anybody else like that. So I would characterize you like that. So very welcome. Thank you for joining me this evening for tea, virtual tea that is. Thank you very much, Jansi. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the nice words. Uh, encouraging words. I don't know how much I deserve all of them. Uh, thank you so much. And virtual tea is um, uh, delicious enough. All right. Thank you. When things get better, we'll have proper tea another time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. When we talk of Vice Chancellor, there are some legends. So, first, I'd like to tell you these legends and take your reaction to that. I don't know whether you have heard these before. The first legend is that the Maharaja of Travancore had invited Albert Einstein to come as the Vice Chancellor of Travancore. The second legend is when a new Vice Chancellor wanted to call on the Chief Minister, so EMS Nambutkar, he said, Oh, you are a Vice Chancellor, I should come and call on you. And the third is a saying that when a good teacher becomes a vice chancellor, we lose a good teacher and get a bad vice chancellor. What are your reactions to all these legendary statements? Well, uh, Have I, you heard them before? <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard all these earlier. And okay. I, I heard the first two, the, the legend part, uh, before I joined as vice chancellor. Uh, and I, I wanted to believe in them, you know, and that was a great strength. It was empowering uh, that um, uh, you are on a on a on a base of power, and uh, so that really helped me. The third part of uh, uh, losing the academician <laughs> and also ending up as a bad administrator. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't accept that, you know. For me, um, the the transition from uh, the academician to the uh, academic administrator. It was a challenge. Um, of course, uh, uh, there is a, there is an element of loss because you know, I was in the prime of my academic career. I right. loved what I taught. I loved what I researched on, and I really liked the career. I chose it, you know. So uh, uh, and so I had to I had to stop in the middle of many of the academic projects that I had launched. Um, so that was a loss, but although I tried to continue that in my own way, uh, I could have done much more if I had remained as a pure uh, exclusive academician. But uh, uh, what actually made me uh, go in for this uh, chancellorship was actually a dream. A dream uh, of making a university uh, teacher friendly, research friendly, student friendly, uh, and, a, uh, and a great place for learning, uh, research, teaching, and academic interaction. Probably many teachers who work in the universities do have these dreams, uh, particularly when you uh, meet with very unhappy, discouraging responses from the administration. Uh, 
uh, many of us, particularly because I was also the director of a center, academic center for comparative literature, uh, you know, sometimes you felt that only if we had got some more encouragement from the administration, we could have done much more. You know, that idea of going beyond the discipline and beyond the routine academic chores to build up something new and, you know, attract the academic community from uh, outside means, your little world. So, that means that as a, as a professor, many of the problems that you found, you thought as a vice chancellor that you might be able to resolve them. Solve them, exactly. Was, exactly. That, the, was that the ambition? Yes. Uh, to, some, to some extent, you know, uh, I, I succeeded in doing that also. Because I could understand the problems of my own colleagues, you know, my own fraternity. So I, I could help a lot of them, particularly in their aspirations to go higher, to become innovative, to bring in new practices. Uh, uh, I think I, I could help a lot of people. And uh, that was a success and also starting new courses. Uh, I felt that, you know, even now I feel we are so stuck with old things. You know, the, the unwillingness to change, the unwillingness to really, really accept the relevant, you know, the modern, the upcoming, the, the unwillingness to update ourselves. That is sort of inherent in us in all systems, and particularly, you know, in the university. And it's a it's a world of learning. If, if you if you if you prevent, you know, if you inhibit the sources of updation, then there's no point in running a university because knowledge is the base for development. So But you know the you know the story of Dr. Ayapa Panikya. You know, he's a very distinguished academician. Everybody liked him. And uh, he was offered this post. He's not a legend. The minister called him yes. over and told him that please take over as vice chancellor of Kerala University. And he first, when he said no, the minister was surprised. He said, everybody is at my door asking for this job. What is wrong with you? Then he said, I have so much to do. I have left over so much to do as an academician, as a writer as a translator and therefore i don't think i'll be doing something you know which satisfies me if I, I become an administrator and he achieved much more i don't know what kind of administrator he would have been many people do not have understood what he was saying anyway <laughs> so, but, uh, but i think this was a great example of someone preferring to stick to what he likes and what he likes to do and succeeded in it so there are both the cases are there. So I can understand very well someone who wants to improve the situation by being part of it rather than carry on with your academic skills. But what are your specific issues? Was it non-cooperation of the staff? Was it non-cooperation of the government? I mean, I'm not asking for specific things, but what was the general problem, general situation? Or, or, or mindset which does not change. Which one would you say about the most difficult part? Uh, about the Vice Chancellor's post? Yes. Uh, well, sir, um, well, Dr. Paniker refused uh, Vice Chancellorship, but he was a creative writer. And he was a wonderful administrator also in the department, you know. Okay, I see. One of us, you know, many of us, most of us ladies, we were in, a, in, in different stages of our personal life. He just gave us a, you know, such great encouragement. So as vice chancellor, you know, uh, the problems are, uh, uh, well, some some belong to the system itself. And of course, uh, uh, then this, uh, uh, what shall I say, this kind of uh, uh, inevitable relationship between uh, the state and the university in state universities. That is definitely a, um, a problem, you know, uh, something which blocks you want to do so many things and uh, one problem is that you don't have the money uh, financial problems are real problems See, uh, Mahatma Gandhi University where I was the vice chancellor uh, we had this uh, uh, what shall I say uh, uh, compensation of getting money from our self-financing courses so right. the university started um, its own self-financing courses like the first thing in the state uh, directly our own, not private institutions, but our own. But um, I found that, you know, the quality of education that the university offered under its direct governance um, 
left much to be desired although we did make money so the poor infrastructure you know the poorly pay, paid teachers in the self financing institutions although we could you know help for example nursing education and um, produce so many nurses who went abroad saved not their own families but the entire community the locality all those things are there but still talking as an as an academician i felt that you know we had to compromise on the quality academic quality when we made money so to some extent uh, we were in a better state than other universities regarding uh, the financial resources but at the same time it was not enough the other uh, block is the syndicate right. the the constitution of the syndicate unless that is changed you cannot expect anything in terms of academic improvement in the whole state see we need and i i i put with this difference because when i became the vice chancellor of a you know when i the, this university that right. i was the founder of central university we had only academicians in the first governing board in the first executive council you know iit directors um and uh, former vice chancellors they had only to they had they had nothing else but academic issues and they encouraged me at every minute whereas it was a different situation in state university where whatever good intention that you brought into the you know into the body into the meetings so it's a miniature political world that yes. it is constituted exactly exactly so you have on the one hand the pressure from the government and of course you serve two two different governments and you survive that was quite remarkable yeah. but at the same time they are constituted in such a way that you get a reflection of the politics outside this is really the main problem of our education system yeah. because it may be perhaps better to have a council or executive council or something like that rather than this politically oriented senate and the syndicate yes i I was, member, uh, i was a member in the jnu executive council i found a difference there also um, of course they also had their own political inclinations and all those things but at the same time uh, uh, well ichuri uh, was there as a member mohan gobal was there was there you know everybody had their own you know political differences all those things were there but at the same time when it came to the meeting they talked only about jnu and its academic growth we had problems but only that and nothing else no personal issues no unhealthy you know uh, rift and quarrels no, no promotion of no promotion of peons no no nothing, <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> or recruitment of attached assistants no, no, no. all this i know but anyway that is a reality that we have to face with but did you have any time when you had to really stand firm did they nickname you jansi rani or something <laughs> you were that firm. Did that happen? <laughs> well, uh, I, I did. I did succeed in, you know, introducing many new things. And uh, I was also, I'm also happy to say that I, I finally succeeded in getting the consent of those who started with opposition in the beginning. I was able to convince them. Probably, you know, I'm also not a bad communicator. I, I could, I could somehow convince them. And uh, and I think sometimes I felt that in the syndicate, they just spoke because you know they had to. You know, they were asked to or something. And finally, you know, they agreed. Uh, so I started new courses like the Sostar Management course, and uh, I could actually construct a new building for the examination wing. The pathetic state of the staff, you know, who could not even get up when I go to the room section because. But do they really? Off. Do they really have a veto on these things, mm-hmm. or they just express opinions and then you carry on? You see, you can't go on. You can't proceed. You see, they come. You see, look, you go to the syndicate with 350 items on the agenda book, and you cannot even complete half of it. It's being it's being churned again and again because of the fight. So they are not fighting with the vice chancellor. They are fighting with one another because they also represent different political, you know, sections of those things. So it is not. And at the same time, in the last two hours, in the last two or one hour. Um, things are just passed people just put out the agenda name agenda number okay 32 teacher 32 okay passed <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no time because of kind of drama yes but i i think things are changing you know i i, I was the vice chancellor more than 10 years ago and i think things are changing there is improvement i heard this is a great thing you know to hear about but at the same time i feel that 
universities should be left with the academic freedom and i think in the academic freedom index afi india stands very poor you know just before saudi arabia we are, we are even you know below pakistan that's a i think and unless you were uh, you were instrumental in bringing about autonomy to you know colleges in the state and the great change that has been brought about in the colleges and i'm the member of some of the academic councils of these colleges you know it, it's uh, of course it has its own teething problems no doubt about it but, but it is a move it's a wonderful move i guess well now we are moving towards abolition of affiliation <laughs> That is yeah. what the new. Uh, we'll come. We'll come to that later. I don't want to waste it now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but we've done. We have done a lot of study on these criteria. To me, do you think we will never be able to make those criteria? Uh, I, I think I missed some of your uh, earlier statement because the technical. No. Could you repeat, no. It, sir, please? No. What I was saying was that the ranking system all around the world. We often complain that we are nowhere there. Not in 200. Not in 300. Sometimes something comes up suddenly, then it disappears and so on. So if you look at the criteria which I did, I found that at least ten out of twenty we can never attain. Yeah. Like for example, how many Nobel prizes have you won? How many patents do you have? How many foreign students you have? How many foreign faculty you have? These are the questions they ask, and we get zero, 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 zero. So where can you meet this gap? Well, still it is possible, sir. You know, in some of the things, um, see Nobel laureate. Well, hundred years after Tagore, we haven't got a Nobel laureate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, there are many issues, even for literature. I must, uh, I must uh, share with you, sir. See, we have wonderful writers in this country. You know, in the regional writings, and they translate it properly. And unless these reach the Nobel committee, you know. They can't. They can't be considered. And I, I'm. T- I'm telling you, sir. You know, even even the present Nobel laureates, there are uh, at least more than ten uh, better writers in this country in the regional language. There's no doubt about it. But it doesn't reach them. So these are these criteria. Uh, I'm sure that these criteria on which our ranking is made, there is an unfairness. It doesn't suit them. Two suitors. But they are great aspirations. You know, they are great targets for us. No, to work, to work, to yes, work. ambition. We can, ambition. we can aspire yeah, to, yeah, aspire yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Can aspire we can, to it. we can. Our brains are really good. Uh, we can. No, no, no. Nobel Prize. What you say is right. I have said it many times that since we do not have enough translation. In fact, Tagore got the prize because he translated himself. Exactly. Yeah. And Dr. Panikkar used to make a great. Uh, you know, he translated many things himself. He encouraged other people to translate. You have done translation. Sachidanandan is doing a lot of translation. But that's not enough. And in ranking, another thing I discovered was that they don't look at every university in the world. When you rank, you know yes, they don't yes. have the time. How can you ever do that? Yeah. What they do is they know that Harvard is good, they know Princeton is good, they know three universities in China, and they just take that. They don't give any opportunity to a humble little university to go and fight with them. That doesn't happen. So yeah. it is an unfairness there. But at the same time, if we don't know, the problem is now we are talking about foreign universities coming to India. Then we are saying that we'll accept only those in the first hundred in the best universities. How can we say that when we are not anywhere near that? So you have to bring your bring your requirements down. Many places we say that we collaborate only with universities of a higher rank, and that I think is also also a problem. It is we have to be more realistic. And of course, now we have our own standards to compare universities, and then keep these models as models, and rather than criticize ourselves by saying we are not. I think that may be the only way to approach that. Anna, yes. Uh, I was just about to say that if we really, if we really implement national education policy uh, with all discretion, with good intention, in a fair way. I think uh, you know, uh, great things are ahead for us. But you have to make proper preparations. You know, it, it's a wonderful vision which is there. It is modern. It's even about the online teaching that is gone. You know, the use of technology. It's very much there. 
Uh, it also talks about research, uh, National Research Foundation. You know, the moment we hear about it, we start criticizing. And uh, it, also, it, it also says that it, it wants to de-bureaucratize education system, which is the essential. And it wants to fill up people, you know, fill up the system with academicians. And even the governing board will board will consist only of academicians. All these are good. So let us go. Uh, let us let us go one by one. Okay. I was coming to NEP. I think both of us have similar views on the NEP. Yes. Yeah. But before that, one question. When you talk about excellence, won't the introduction of private universities make a big difference in Kerala? Well, um, competition. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, more money, financial ability, more autonomy. And we see that in the north, most of the private universities are doing very well. Why are we resisting it in Kerala? What is the problem? Well, um, with caution, we should do this with caution. Um, one thing, you know, um, when you say many private universities are doing very well, there are also universities where uh, things are not that okay. I've been the examiner of some of these, you know, PhD dissertations of these universities. Uh, you know, academic compromises are made and uh, um, lots of vested interests, you know, come in the way. And sometimes the whole family, you know, uh, manages an entire university. So there are issues. But at the same time, as you rightly said, this will definitely kindle a competitiveness, a healthy competitiveness in quality. So that is very important. And also, uh, private universities are uh, more expensive. So I am very concerned about the divide, you know, the social divide that education might make at any cost. I think education should not be an instrument in contributing to the to the inequality in society. So, you know, only, only you see, it is now happening in our private colleges now, you know, see this self-financing institution, some of them are doing extremely well, but very expensive. To get into them, you see, to join a, a BCom, you know, to join a, a commerce B, B, uh, BCom course, you have to spend lakhs. See, th that is a very unfortunate situation. And uh, what explanation can we give uh, to, to these children who come from, you know, financially backward families that they can't pursue their studies? It's not because they are bad in terms of their intellectual, you know, prowess or intellectual or brain wise qualities. So I'm only concerned about that. Otherwise, I am actually, I support private universities. Because no, Jansi, you, you are aware that we have drafted a private university bill. Yeah. Yes. If you have carefully looked at it, you will find that we have taken care of these things. Okay. In fact, we wanted to ensure that no student should be unable to go to a private university on account of finance. That was a fundamental principle which we put into that bill. Yeah. But and also about various other things. But nobody has bothered. Nobody even wanted to look at it. Yes. Within the government itself, there was so much opposition to it that we could not even get it considered. So there is some kind of a mental block, and that is strange because in Kerala, right, education has been in private hands. If there are no missionaries, there was no NSS, there was no SNDP, there would have been no colleges in this country. So that the discrimination you are making between those private public institutions and proper private universities with its own motivation. And you restrict them, put them in Lakshman Rekha around them. That's what we did. But the time has come for us to at least examine it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I know you did uh, good work. Uh, Higher Education Council prepared this. I know that. Um, uh, but you know, in Kerala, as you rightly said, there is this kind of blind opposition. People think that, you know, socialism versus uh, privatization. <laughs> no, no, not always. It can happen, but not well, always. They should go to China. They should go to China and see how socialism yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this online education. You know, I've been a champion of this. 2014, I think. 2014, we had a global conference on online education. Because you had already left. You were already in the central university. And these MOOCs, that is something which I thought was revolutionary. So we did a lot of study, made a lot of recommendations, but not even one, except for the present Vice Chancellor of uh, University. Except for that one professor, nobody cared for, cared for it. Now they were not even willing to experiment with it. How is that if we had done it at that time, 
now that we have been thrown into the water and we are complaining that we don't know how to swim we could have done a lot of work in that and now it is this is not going to end with the pandemic because we are discovering some advantages in online education so therefore now it is time for us to set in out with this and embellish it even more rather than waiting for the vaccine to come and run immediately into a college okay. yeah how do you compromise this you have been a teacher you have been a vice chancellor you have seen the world how will this online system will we have a day when there are no buildings for universities like sam sam petroda says or will you have a company now uh, i think we will we, we must and we will have a competition so as you said sir see this panic that is now emerging from the kind of you know education that we are offering during the pandemic times it would not have been there if we had really you know started getting ourselves into the moods and swayam you know all these things are available the problem was that you know some of uh, the teachers the teaching community and the academic administration uh, it was not willing to even understand what is open line you know open courseware what it meant it if if it had been initiated into that you know we could have actually managed this time uh, more meaningfully anyway now it is, it is it we have to accept this not only that you know um, even if we have this uh, uh, brick and mortar uh, universities and uh, which has to which will go into digital dormitories very very fast uh, uh, we will have to have a blended learning a hybrid learning system where by face to face te- teaching teaching and online learning will have to be combined because face to face teaching is going to become inadequate see what you can really dig up from online every day knowledge is changing knowledge is being added on to so how how far can the teacher keep himself or herself updated so teachers have to perform as mentors for advising for giving the right counseling right guidance to students from where you can dig up the right information which suits you which suits your curriculum and teachers should become not merely teachers but deliverers of knowledge but creators of content online education what you can do now is actually teachers should become content creators which is possible you know things are so easy now uh, and uh, i think uh, now uh, i am really concerned that teachers now still are in the not all there are many institutions which are functioning very well but teachers still uh, they are anxious to complete the finish the portions finish the portions and, and they are dreaming of going back to the class yes right, they are yes, they're not yes. taking it they not accept yes. it yes. no but two things one could do first is make it compulsory for teachers to choose out courses and give them to the students Okay, the teachers have no time. I have asked teachers, "What is your daily schedule?" They have no time for preparation. <laughs> you know, always talking about managing this, managing that. When do you prepare? Then they laugh because they think they already prepared thirty years ago by passing that MA examination. You cannot send them back to school. So the only way, as you said, to improve their knowledge or at least make use of the knowledge available online, it's a must. So it must continue. Yeah. Second, and also, sir, sir, yeah, sir. Online teaching is not merely you know giving a lecture from somewhere in your house and you know addressing the students. Teaching is a different methodology. Its pedagogy is different, and the teachers have to be given training. And I think Kerala government you know did some work in this regard. You know, giving you know uh, batch by batch training in this because there is a big digital divide among the teachers. you know one generation which is unwilling and which is not quite okay with the with the digital with the online system and the other youngsters who who have not been given an opportunity to learn the new you know online teaching system so unless we solve that and really identify what the proper the ideal the really useful online teaching is uh, what we are doing now is something wrong and you know we just we, we are only just transferring this to this laptop or mobile and uh, we don't actually go go into the into, into the real change that is needed and google classroom is a wonderful thing interactive classrooms are possible and students yeah. learn a lot 
students have become you know excellent in animation they can you know shoot uh, uh, they have become photographers they can do such a lot of things and make them do all those things and also multidisciplinarity that is important teachers should not just stick themselves to geography and geology and that's it they should actually relate history with ecology you know what is history if you don't relate to what is happening at the time in nature you know in the world around uh, you know in the human world so uh, things are things are absolutely different you know the times are changing and i think online you said teachers don't have time but i think teachers should make time i am the daughter of a i said you a question from a teacher she is worried as to the problems she will have when she goes into the classroom after this what is your answer to that what do you think what shall i do because i have lost my students <laughs> they only listen to online classes then how do i gain them back is a worry that she has she has a young college lecturer no the college professor take it take it not as a problem but as a challenge you know it's a uh, uh, first thing I, i would like to tell teachers is that they should um, train themselves in, in loving communication you know the the new generation uh, they are the digital natives that we are the digital immigrants uh, so they are born into that and they have a different idiom they have a different way of receiving information receiving communication and teachers um, uh, they should understand i think they have to be empathetic you know what students are going on now through now they are left with you know they they have been denied friendship they have been denied the campus life you know they are going through a very sad time so have love and sympathy for them but the academic problems are there you know many of the things the basic things are not taught uh, lab experience is not there and uh, many of the scientific experiments they have never done Uh, so these simulations and all that they will not be you know, uh, adequate so they have missed a lot in academics so if they are promoted to the next grade without having gone through the necessary training necessary exposure there are certain academic issues so i i we have been having certain discussion with other academicians i think a particular uh, phase a particular time and a, a slot should be given for checking for checking how far they have missed academically and uh, you have to give something some kind of a, a very you know crash course or something to make up for what they have lost otherwise they can't build on you know what what they have lost so that is an issue and then i think uh, teachers have to be mentors teachers have to be facilitators teachers have to be you know much more than what they are now and those teachers who are like that they are always sought out they don't have problems they have only you know challenges no, but uh, but i think the time has come for us to devise a hybrid system yes. when just as we are looking out towards the vaccine i hope the universities and the governments will devise a method by which both can be combined i think that that culture we don't have yet yeah. and that may be important anyway jansi we have come inevitably to you yourself have brought up the education policy i don't want to bore you with that because both of us have done so many webinars on the education policy we know it backwards so i'm not going to raise those questions the question i'm raising is what are the objections particularly of the kerala government the minister said the education minister said this is the death knell of public education in kerala this is her words his words the vice chairman of the higher education council says that we cannot become a global economy we cannot be education cannot be considered part of the global economy because then it will be corporates will make it global. these are very nebulous kind of uh, questions and the third would be this is saffronization some kind of a bjp taking over how do you meet this criticism do you endo- endorse this or if not how do we answer these questions well uh, yes and no um, see education is in the concurrent list and uh, we can take our own freedom well uh, privatization and corporatization of education how far can you prevent that you cannot prevent it at the same time maintaining a fairness you said you know the private universities come in in your proposal it was there it gives scholarship to students who are who do not have the financial resources 
we can solve this problem just because you think that only private parties private agency succeed in implementing the policy and hence prevent it then we are doing a great you know harm uh, to any any dream of improvement in our education the quality of education in our state particularly is very bad see think of it if you ask a be a graduate or even a post graduate to write a properly worded letter of leave leave application or a project proposal still as i am suffering from the illness as i am suffering from my mother's oh, illness <laughs> at least heaven free logically constructed no so something that this that there are problems there are issues so i think uh, uh, the this this anxiety about uh, uh, national education policy i think uh, we should not overplay that instead of that let us let us give it a, give a try and saffronization i don't believe in that see curriculum formation uh, curriculum uh, design is our own uh, we can do it the introduction of sanskrit they say is saffronization why not learn sanskrit <laughs> wonderful language if you learn sanskrit you know you become more learned see uh, see learning a language is not saffronization learn hindi you need to learn hindi if you really want to survive in the northern parts of india i myself you know becoming the central university vice chancellor many times i felt you know i could not understand uh, because some of them speak start speaking in in hindi so uh, learning hindi is not a, of course imposition is a different thing and also this learning in malayalam malayalam, malayalam medium see i think all this is good but do we have enough stuff in malayalam language enough stuff translated uh, sensibly translated so let the language institutes do that job and get them get it ready otherwise otherwise you know we are doing a harm to these students but i i will tell the teacher I, mean, i would like to tell the teachers translation is not a crime okay use use your mother tongue use any language that the student understands and is happy about but declaring this is your malayalam medium alone will save malayalam language i do i don't agree with that i was a malayalam i was i was a malayalam medium till my 8th standard but 8 9 and 10 i was in the english medium but i was taught good english by by my teachers from first to so i had no problem so you know, the problem before us is that you know we know neither english nor malayalam oh, that, that no now it's supposed to be the english medium supposedly english medium but most teachers just translate from english to malayalam that's what they do yes and uh, therefore the students don't speak malayalam they don't speak english either i i'm really sh- yeah i'm really shocked these students who learn history economics sociology all these things in english and write exams in english why is it that they cannot speak or write ordinary things in error free english i just can't understand that you know they learn so many things and english english curriculum english language curriculum trust with destiny gandhi's philosophy orwell's essays and all the great writers short stories and novels still their sensibility is bad and they they don't know to write malayalam these english medium uh, students they hate malayalam because they don't know malayalam and i have also gone through the curriculum and the mode of teaching no wonder including my grand no wonder they don't like malayalam because that is the way it's being handled so lots of things you know in the present system need change let us make use of nep national education policy and opt as an opportunity to make changes and let us let us think about it because i i don't think this fear of you know joining global economy and you know becoming part of the corporate world and hesitating uh, with the national education policy i don't think it will ultimately help us uh, I, i don't think so see what is happening now what is happening now think of all these posh schools and you know colleges what a great divide see these some of these schools they have air conditioned classrooms you should when you go to those campuses you think you are in a foreign campus like harvard university or something i've been to some of these schools and there are also schools the school that i studied in still is in the same condition right half walls and in a very decrepit state rooms leaking rooms leaking all those things are there yeah so
No, that I think we have to. But the, what will happen is if we reject the national education policy, we would be left behind. Yes. Because we will do in our own way and they will go ahead. And that is going to be a big problem. And also, large number of Malayalis work outside Kerala. And that, but in any case, the NEP, there is no suggestion that higher education should be in the vernacular. We are only talking about the primary school, yeah. where it should be in Malayalam. Yes. But they are not saying that in the colleges they should have a vernacular at all. It is our policy, or at least our aspiration. And therefore, we will be left behind. That's the that part. So, this has to be, this will not be implemented the way it is written, I'm sure. But a constructive and open attitude, particularly by the Kerala government, is very essential. I do not know why, you, how you can create it. And uh, that is really the... So I say that three things, if all the political parties can agree. Number one, on purpose of education. There is no agreement on that. Secondly, language. There is no agreement on that. And then privatization. So on these three points, some kind of a consensus has to be evolved. Otherwise, every five years, we'll go back and come forward. This is what will happen. All that we try to do in the higher education council are all stacked up. This is what all of us, as you are educationist, your views are always sought. I think the politicians have to come together on an all-party basis to resolve this fundamental difference and then only we'll be able to move. I, I, I think they should actually, you know, uh, make a core group of uh, experts, experienced people, you know, who are not prejudiced, who are not biased in the approach to this national education policy, sit together and evolve a policy from this. You know, we can very, we also need a policy. Uh, uh, we, we can very well evolve that. But saying a firm no is going to really land us in trouble. And, uh, now there are many issues, you know, our students, they can't go abroad and study, you know, because of the, this uh, COVID issue. There are lots of issues and parents are so anxious. Parents are so worried uh, about the children's education. So I think the government, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, but in the priority list of the government, education is not there. I know, I keep saying that. I used to say that to the chief minister. <laughs> that if he had spent 10% of the time he spent on the metro, <laughs> we, on education, we would have done much better. <laughs> anyway, that is all just dreams for us. Then, two points more. One, of course, is foreign university. What is your view on that? We don't have foreign universities in India. But many foreign universities are willing to come. And I was with a, a victim of something that I did not want. I did not ask for foreign universities to come. I simply said, let us cooperate with foreign universities. So now we say that foreign universities are going to come. Do you think that will be a threat or do you think it will happen? Um, it can be a threat. It can be a threat. But um, I think the, the government is already into it. Uh, national education policy actually speaks for that. Uh, it agrees with that. And I think the bill, uh, Warren University's bill is still lying there, but it will be passed. That's right, it has to go through parliament. Yeah, it has to go through parliament, but in the political current political situation, it will go without any debate uh, because of the political you know, nature of our, uh, our atmosphere. But, uh, well, foreign universities, as I remember uh, in, the, in the bills, you know, uh, even, the, even the profit that the universities get out of this, they have to read. They cannot take. They cannot yeah, they take. Cannot. Yeah. So, if that is followed, I think uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing to do. And moreover, you see, uh, what else can we do? At least it will prevent our students. I think uh, so many of them leave the country and end up oh, there. Yeah, yeah, the brain, this brain drain uh, can be prevented to a to a great extent. And it's a huge country, and uh, you can never have a. The same education and same. Exactly. Exactly. You cannot, you cannot find that diversity is our wealth. So uh, definitely, it, this will mean that um, an elitist, uh, uh, you know, uh, dimension is there. Definitely, but uh, but then uh, we make money, we take loans from no, banks but, and but send but our Jansi, children abroad. Jansi, it already exists. 
without having foreign universities even the children of the same people who object to universities are foreign universities are in foreign universities <laughs> so, so there is no there should be any mental block against it but i i think but, rule, you know if we go by rules you know we we frame the rules we frame the rules which will which will not stand in the way of um, fairness so and see that they are they are followed the problem is you know we ourselves allow people to uh, overcome rules and we think that the clever people are those who can actually uh, you know outlive rules and you know ignore rules so success is often identified with uh, ignoring rules or defeating the rules i think we should come out of this See, in foreign countries you know they go by law uh, they have their own guidelines they have freedom they have autonomy but there are certain guidelines and they go by that in this country in this particular state particularly what we are seeing around is people have no regard for law have no regard for guidelines so foreign universities or private universities or national education policy unless we honor the law unless we honor you know the 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 guidelines we are a democratic country we are a democratic people we have made them our people have made these laws so i, I think uh, I, i think the young people you know how they watch the whole thing critically you know how they have dismissed us our generation uh, our credibility is lost and uh, uh, even this online education i find that you know what the teacher asked it was right uh, they are di- they may dismiss the teachers you know mentally dismiss the teachers because they find that teachers who have paid for their appointment and joined the schools and colleges and make a poor show in classrooms they find the online classes or lectures by experts from other universities from you know from good institutions they find it better than their classroom experience these things are happening and uh, we have to think about all these things whether we really to we have to, we have to remain relevant yes <laughs> relevant and, and think of the youth you know they are so different their their mind state their mindset is different and i think uh, even our government or our policy making Uh, they don't think of that uh, i i as, as oh, but the youth, but the youth is being misguided you know when we held this international conference nine vice chancellors former vice chancellors wrote a letter that this conference will destroy education in india and so the poor young boys and girls stood in the call of hotel and you know attacked everybody what did they know about it what was it that we were trying to do nobody even thought about it. and yeah, finally a sensitive question i heard you saying in one of your interviews that in interviews that you were not very happy about the formation of the kerala state higher education council it somehow affected the functioning of the vice chancellors as you know i was an accidental vice chairman of the higher education council but i never saw, i never saw the council as superior to the vice chancellors or any external authority vice chancellors were very much part of the institution because there was a governing council where every vice chancellor was supposed to be but none of these worked because of the contradictions within the government itself my problems were more with my own government than with opposition in doing things in the education sector there is a total diversity of approach between the government the department of education and the higher education council but i did find any kind of clash with vice chancellor every vice chancellor was very helpful but why do you feel that this was going to be an impossible and do you still believe in that uh, well i don't i don't believe in that but you know i i wish it didn't happen sir you were an excellent vice chairman you you were so democratic and so understanding you've seen the whole world you've been in the best institutions uh, the mindset of many particularly you know political appointments this vice chancellorship often you know Uh, turned out to be uh, political appointments and when i asked the vice chancellor when i was in the governing council meeting i felt you know it's a what shall i say it's a bland it's no spirit nothing happening and higher education council is supposed to be a mentor you know giving inspiration encouragement giving new ideas i didn't hear any of those things in those i felt it was a waste of time secondly What is by the you had left by the time i came you left mrs i had left i had left i left <laughs> but you worked with us as a central university vice chancellor you worked with us we worked uh, on research yes. we worked on various other things yes uh, so uh, we 
yeah so the, the personality the leadership quality of uh, those who head the higher education council it's uh, it's very important uh, I, i'm not saying i'm not making a personal remark on this but uh, i i feel that higher education council can do much more can do much more and uh, so uh, i this practice the earlier practice of one of the council members sitting in the syndicate this created some problem for vice chancellors as why when a former vice chancellor became the executive chair, chairman of the chairman of the council he abolished that now <laughs> the ashcc does not send a representative yeah. most vice chancellors are unhappy with the gentleman i was in i i was unhappy <laughs> exactly. but but my justification for that was that was the only i and dear i had in the university i can't go and sit in the syndicate but i thought it was helpful for us to know what is happening in each but he should not go and interfere in the day day to day administration like an ordinary syndicate member he should have been an observer an advisor and information gatherer and that was the advice i had given them but they are themselves former educationists they want to go and fight their battles with me without without remembering that they are members of the higher education representatives of the higher education council so they wouldn't consult me what they are going to say there they say things on the so anyway that that problem is over but i saw the higher education council as basically an advisory group that is why we experimented with very many things at the arabic university which nobody like people did not like we talked about the british university we talked about autonomy we talked about um, you know private university so this was the menu that you provided we provided to the government and it was for the government to pick and choose and we chose only one which is autonomy <laughs> everything else still remains as a menu so, so well, is... think of it sir see when we, we were all in the know of all these things you know so when you find that out of the 10 things that you propose after having done so much of work you know research so much of work is involved on only one thing is accepted and that also with a lot of hesitation and i know that some of these autonomous colleges are facing hell in their yes. with university <laughs> so they wish they never had autonomy <laughs> yeah so 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 that that lack of power that lack of you know uh, what shall i say a strength on the part of um, uh, higher education comes that probably made me make a comment but i don't have anything you know any any you know bias or no but the basic problem is the lack of consensus among political parties exactly. that is really the problem that is the reason yeah. yeah well thank you very much we had a very very thank interesting you, discussion i try to avoid all the questions you have answered elsewhere so i was looking for something new to ask you and but sir sure. sir i just to, uh, i think i told you once sir sir this particular uh, covid period you know uh, it's a family period you know education has been brought into the families and i think um, it's also a time all the conversation is on it i read your i read your article on <laughs> yeah so women have a great role mothers have a great role you know in providing the right ambience for learning in the homes uh, yesterday i heard a, a student telling me oh there's no joy the teacher is sitting on the bed and giving this lecture uh, <laughs> teachers also have to be very careful you know to bring in some kind of formality and attractiveness you know in the whole interaction there is no physical interaction but the te- the mothers you know, the ladies in the homes also you know make them feel make our children feel that you know education is a very important thing learning is a very important thing and what they are receiving is you know fund of knowledge from a source from their guru so at both sides uh, because you, you told me a teacher asked you how they would you know manage the situation now and afterwards i think yeah. we have to be we have to be more serious we have to be more careful and we have to be more loving and we have to, we have to think that you know i think we, we don't we underestimate our children that's what i feel we underestimate them we don't understand them uh, we don't think of their feelings we don't think of their frustrations and uh, now i is uh, you know an i is uh, uh, candidate uh, and a person as uh, a tribal girl Uh, got into the IAS, you know. We had a we had a an exposure to the surroundings in which she picked up all these, you know, learning. How much opposition she had to face. So things are possible. It's possible. So I think uh, that kind of a motivation has to be built up inside the home and from the other end, from the from the teaching end. 
this well, we haven't had much time to adjust ourselves to the situation so we are yeah, still true, sir. Uh, no, but true, you sir. know that experiment which was done in some village a company made some walls from from holes on the walls okay. and left computers there no instructor no booklet nothing i left the school children into that within 10 days they were astonished that the mastery that they had acquired with these computers with no education nothing to teach because these are all intelligent machines you know so it is not necessary <laughs> you see earlier when you even you bought a small iron there will be 20 pages of instructions but you get an iphone today there are no instructions <laughs> you have to learn it yourself so that is possible that inherent ability is very much there so that i think is essential but there is no single answer for any of these questions but people like you have to work harder and harder in order to take that you know that famous michael angelos thing you know every stone has a sculpture in it you have to pull that sculpture out and cut out all the unnecessary things then you become a, become an artist and that i think is the answer to all these yes yes thank you very much jansi this great talk thank you